Marrying Absurd, an essay written by Joan Didion in 1967 and included in her essay collection, Slatching Towards Bethlehem. To be married in Las Vegas, Clark County, Nevada, a bride must swear that she is 18 or has parental permission, and a bridegroom that he is 21 or has parental permission. Someone must put up $5 for the license. On Sundays and holidays, $15. The Clark County Courthouse issues marriage licenses at any time of day or night except between noon and 1 in the afternoon, between 8 and 9 in the evening, and between 4 and 5 in the morning. Nothing else is required. The state of Nevada, alone among these United States, demands neither, demands neither a premarital blood test nor a waiting period before or after the issuance of a marriage license. Driving in across the Mojave from Los Angeles, one sees the signs way out in the desert, looming up from that moonscape of rattlesnakes and mesquite, even before the Las Vegas lights appear like a mirage on the horizon. Getting married? Free license information, first strip exit. Perhaps the Las Vegas wedding industry achieved its peak operational efficiency between 9 p.m. and midnight of August 26, 1965, an otherwise unremarkable Thursday which happened to be by presidential order, the last day on which anyone could improve his draft status merely by getting married. 171 couples were pronounced man and wife in the name of Clark County and the state of Nevada that night. 67 of them by a single justice of the peace, Mr. James A. Brennan. Mr. Brennan did one wedding at the Dunes and the other 66 in his office and charged each couple $8. One bride lent her veil to six others. I got it down from five to three minutes, Mr. Brennan said later of his feet. I could have married them all en masse, but they're people, not cattle. People expect more when they get married. What people who get married in Las Vegas actually do expect, what in the largest sense their expectations are, strikes one as a curious and self-contradictory business. Las Vegas is the most extreme and allegorical of American settlements. Bizarre and beautiful in its finality, and in its devotion to immediate gratification, a place the tone of which is set by mobsters and call girls and ladies' room attendants with amyl nitrite poppers in their uniform pockets. Almost everyone notes that there is no time in Las Vegas, no night and no day, and no past and no future. No Las Vegas casino, however, has taken the obliteration of the ordinary time sense quite so far as Harold's Club in Reno, which for a while issued, at odd intervals in the day and night, mimeographed bulletins carrying news from the world outside. Neither is there any logical sense of where one is. One is standing on a highway in the middle of a vast, hostile desert, looking at an 80-foot sign that blinks Stardust or Caesar's Palace. Yes, but what does that explain? This geographical implausibility reinforces the sense that what happens there has no connection with real life. Nevada cities like Reno and Carson are ranch towns, western towns, places behind which there is some historical imperative. But Las Vegas seems to only exist in the eye of the beholder, all of which makes it an extraordinarily stimulating and interesting place. But an odd one, in which to want to wear a candlelight satin pristilla of Boston wedding dress with chantilly lace insets, tapered sleeves, and a detachable, modified train. And yet the Las Vegas wedding business seems to appeal to precisely that impulse. Sincere and dignified since 1954, one wedding chapel advertises. There are 19 such wedding chapels in Las Vegas, intensely competitive, each offering better, faster, and by implication, more sincere services than the next. Our photos best anywhere. Your wedding on a phonograph record. Candlelight with your ceremony. Honeymoon accommodations. Free transport from your motel to courthouse to chapel and return to motel. Religious or civil ceremonies, dressing rooms, flowers, rings, announcements, witnesses available, and ample parking. All of these services, like most others in Las Vegas, sauna baths, payroll check cashing, chinchilla coats for sale or rent, are offered 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, presumably on the premise that marriage, like craps, is a game to be played when the table seems hot. But what strikes one most about the strip chapels with their wishing wells and stained glass paper windows and their artificial bouvardia 
is that so much of their business is by no means a matter of simple convenience, of late night liaisons between showgirls and baby Crosbys. Of course, there is some of that. One night, around 11 o'clock in Las Vegas, I watched a bride in an orange mini dress and masses of flame-colored hair stumble from a strip chapel on the arm of her bridegroom, who looked the part of the expendable nephew in movies like Miami Syndicate. I gotta get the kids, the bride whimpered. I gotta pick up the sitter. I gotta get to the midnight show. What you get, the bridegroom said, opening the door of a Cadillac Coupe de Ville and watching her crumple on the seat, is sober. But Las Vegas seems to offer something other than convenience. It is merchandising niceness, the facsimile of proper ritual, to children who do not know how else to find it, how to make their arrangements, how to do it right. All day and evening long on the Strip, one sees actual wedding parties, waiting under harsh lights on a crosswalk, standing uneasily in the parking lot of the frontier while the photographer hired by the Little Church of the West, Wedding Place of the Stars, Certifies the occasion, takes the picture. The bride in a veil and white satin pumps, the bridegroom usually in a white dinner jacket, and even an attendant or two. A sister or a best friend in hot pink pieu de soie, a flirtation veil, a carnation nosegay. When I fall in love, it will be forever, the organist plays, and then a few bars of Lohengrin. The mother cries, the stepfather, awkward in his role, invites the chapel hostess to join them for a drink at the Sands. The hostess declines with a professional smile. She has already transferred her interest to the group waiting outside. One bride out, another in, and again the sign goes up on the chapel door. One moment, please. Wedding. I sat next to one such wedding party in a strip restaurant the last time I was in Las Vegas. The marriage had just taken place. The bride still wore her dress the mother, her corsage. A bored waiter poured out a few swallows of pink champagne, on the house, for everyone but the bride, who was too young to be served. You'll need something with more kick than that, the bride's father said with heavy jocularity to his new son-in-law. The ritual jokes about the wedding night had a certain Panglossian character, since the bride was clearly several months pregnant. Another round of pink champagne, this time not on the house, and the bride began to cry. It was just as nice, she sobbed, as I hoped and dreamed it would be.